Our living word this morning comes from Acts 17, verses 16 through 34. I apologize. I'm a little fidgety. I'm not used to being kept in one particular spot. So bear with me while I kind of get situated in the truck moves. Yeah. <laughs> All right. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day, with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicureans and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Aragopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what you mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Aragopas and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He is not served by human hands. And if he needed anything, as if he needed anything, rather he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offering, offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like a gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He's given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Aragopas, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, good morning. We love the honking. I don't know if our, I don't know if our neighbors do, but we do. <laughs> hey, it is good to see you this morning. Good to have you here as our parking lot worship um, again today. It is good to be together, isn't it? Even if we're still apart, it's good to be together as a church. Amen. And um, if we keep this up the whole time, we'll never get, no, it's fine. <laughs> hey, my name is Jim, one of the pastors on staff. Excited to be here with you today. I also want to welcome folks joining us from home on live stream today, if that's you. Glad that you joined us and glad that you uh, logged in this morning to be a part of worship. We, uh, we are blessed again today with wonderful weather, aren't we? I was thinking if this had been Thursday morning, I would have been just a puddle of sweat by now. It would have been 90 degrees already. So amen that God bless us with another beautiful day uh, to be out here together. And uh, I just want to begin though today, I want to begin with a question. And it's a very simple question, it's this. Have you ever experienced something so great, so noteworthy, so amazing in your life that you couldn't wait to tell someone else about it? Have you ever had an experience like that? You know, whatever it was, you know, maybe it was good news that you received about something. I know when, uh, uh, especially a couple that gets pregnant with their first child, they can't wait to tell everybody. We made it a big thing now, haven't we? The big reveal where it's, it's just a big deal. But you couldn't wait to share that news with somebody else. It was so awesome. You just wanted somebody else to share in that joy with you. It was just something that was really too good just to keep to yourself. It was too good, really, not to share. You know, when uh, we lived in Kentucky, we lived in Kentucky in the early 2000s when I was going to seminary, but when we lived there, Amy and I had a favorite restaurant that we liked to go to, that we liked to visit. It was called Ramsey's Diner. If you're ever in Lexington, recommend Ramsey's Diner. It's just a little place, but there were two really, they had a great menu, but two amazing things that we particularly, that we really in, were very particular about and really enjoyed. One of them was it was Amy's favorite sandwich. Every time she would eat it, she would stop in the middle and look at me across the table and say, let me tell you about my sandwich. It was a fried or grilled, I guess it was grilled, grilled zucchini sandwich. Now I get that doesn't sound that good to everybody, uh, but I finally tried it. She finally convinced me one time and it really was amazing. It was really one of the best sandwiches you could ever have uh, without any meat, which is very rare because meat makes everything on a sandwich. But it was really amazing. But the topper, the thing that I enjoyed the most out of anything on their menu was their cherry pie. It was the best cherry pie I've ever had. I, I've come across one since then out of Tip City that's a little bit better maybe. But it was the best cherry pie I ever had. And so you just had to tell someone about it. So I was in Lexington. This was a number of years later after we had moved and we're living in Athens. But I was there with some colleagues and we were attending a conference in Lexington. Well, at the end of the conference, we had to go to dinner. And so guess where I wanted to take everyone to dinner? Because they asked me, where should we go? Ramsey's Diner. Because I had also told them before about the pie. And so my thought was, they need to go to Ramsey's. They need to experience this for themselves. Now, no one ordered the zucchini sandwich other than me, but everybody had pie. Some got the cherry, some got their banana cream, some got a couple of their other pies they had, and they all agreed it was the best pie they'd ever had. When you come across, when you experience something great, what do we do? We invite other people to experience it too, don't we? It's what we do. We share good news with other people. It's just part of who we are. We want someone else to enjoy what we've experienced too. You know, in this passage that Andrea just read for us this morning, we find an account of the Apostle Paul. He's on a journey, he stops in the city of Athens. And while he's there, while he's waiting in Athens, we read this in the very first verse, while Paul was waiting, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. You see, Athens, if you know anything about Athens, it was a pagan city. Um, Athens was actually named after a Greek goddess, Athena. Uh, Athena was a God, was a uh, excuse me a daughter of Zeus some places say uh, that Athena was thought to be Zeus's favorite daughter so in Greek mythology 
So Athens was known for having a lot of statues, a lot of temples that were built to other gods, to idols. Um, there was even an altar, and Andrea read this for us, that was built to an unknown god. So they were so religious, they even built an altar to God they didn't know just to cover their bases so they didn't miss anybody, right? They didn't want to miss anyone. So if you think about this, everywhere Paul would have looked, he would have seen statues to Greek and Roman gods. They would have been all over the city. So here's Athens, where Paul is. It's a spiritual place, definitely a spiritual place, but it's not a very Christian place. Paul even said, he said, I see that you are very religious. So Paul recognized this. And he knew about Athens. He knew about the Athenian people. He knew that they liked to debate. He knew they liked to discuss new ideas. And so he recognized right away. He said, hey, they're curious about spiritual matters. Why not use this opportunity to begin to tell them about Jesus? So Paul, his faith in Jesus, it compelled him to share the good news with others. And you see that in Acts uh, 17, verse 18. Because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. I think Paul's motivation, though, when you think about it, came from probably even a deeper place within him. Because again, in that first verse, verse 16, we read, Paul was greatly distressed from what he saw. He was greatly distressed. Think about that. Because we're talking about this, that Paul was stirred deep within his own spirit. He was unsettled by what he saw. So this really bothered him. And that happens to us, doesn't it? We're watching the news and a story comes on and we see something that, that just really moves us. It really bothers us in a way. And sometimes that compels us to act in response. You know, we had a friend when we lived in Troy who was very passionate about helping dogs that were being abused or mistreated. She was very much passionate about. She was stirred in her spirit, greatly distressed when she would hear stories and see that. And she would do what she could to help rescue these dogs. That's what happens when we see something like that that disturbs us, really stirs us deep within. So that's Paul. Paul sees these people that are curious about searching spiritual matters. They're looking. He sees, he sees they're, they're looking for answers, trying to find meaning, trying to find all these different ways to fill this void that they have but they don't know the way to what they're truly searching for and so they were looking in all the wrong places really when you get to it they were misguided in what they're looking for so here's Paul right here's Paul he's moved in a spirit he's greatly distressed and so he shares the good news of the faith that he discovered when he encountered Jesus you see, it was too good not to share with someone else. So when you look at Paul and you investigate his life and you think about our own life of faith, if we were to base our understanding of faith on what we witness here uh, with Paul, and if you read the other accounts that Paul writes later um, in the New Testament, if you look at his life and how he lived it out, how he lived out his faith, we would have to say this. We'd have to come up with this summation. We would say, that faith leads us to tell others about Jesus. That's what it does. It leads us to tell others about Jesus. You know, take a moment. Think back to your own life, especially if you're like me or some of us here that may not have grown up in the church. Let me ask, how did you first hear about Jesus? How did you first hear about Jesus? If you were like me, someone took the initiative and invited you to church on a Sunday morning. Or maybe they invited you to some other event um, faith, where faith was shared and Jesus was talked about. And so your journey of faith, if it's like mine, started because someone else invited you to come and see. They invited you to come and to see. You know, for me, the guy's name was Greg Brookhart. I played racquetball with Greg uh, during the week at the Y, and he kept saying to me, hey, we've got church on Sunday morning. You should come and visit. And I would say, that's great. And then I would go run on Sunday morning. That's what I did. It was the day to get my long run in. But finally, one Sunday morning, I went. I went to church to visit. Greg wasn't there that Sunday. 
But it turned out I sat with his dad and it was in that church where I finally gave my life to Christ. But that wouldn't have happened if someone would not have invited me to come and see. He took the initiative to invite me to come and see. If you look at the New Testament, look at the disciples of Jesus. How many of the disciples of Jesus came to be with Jesus and ended up following him because someone else invited them to come and see? Someone had an encounter with Jesus. Then they went immediately. They went to their friends and their neighbors, their brothers, their sisters. They invited them. Come with me. Come see this guy that I met. Come. You need to experience him for yourself. Come and see who we have found. Peter, undoubtedly one of the most influential disciples of Jesus. He was part of the inner circle with James and John, the three that were always invited to Jesus, to, to things the other 12 weren't always invited to. He came to meet Jesus because his brother Andrew invited him. You can find the account. It's in John's Gospel. It's in the first chapter. I'll read it for you. Here's verses 40 to 42. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard what John, this is John the Baptist, had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was go find his brother, Simon Peter, and bring him to meet Jesus too. The first thing he did. Another case you find in John's Gospel. This is the woman at the well, the encounter she had with Jesus. It's in John chapter 4. She went to the well at noon to get water, which is not when you went to get water in that culture. You would go early in the morning when it was cooler. It had been like this week. You wouldn't want to go get water at noon this week, would you? It was 90 degrees. You would go at 7 a.m. But she went because she had a sordid past. So she went at noon. And while there, she had an encounter with Jesus. And this is what we read about that later. This is verse, uh, verses 28 and 30. Then leaving her water jar, by the way, the water jar is the very reason she went to the well, left it behind. The woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And so they came out of the town and they made their way toward him. So here's a woman, again, a sordid past. She had an encounter with Jesus. Her experience, too good not to share, right? So she goes back to the people in her town. Remember, these are the people she's trying to stay away from, people that probably have a low opinion of her. And she invites them to come and meet Jesus. If you read the rest of that account, verses 39 to 42, what do you find? Many people from that town came to believe in Jesus because of her testimony. But then when Jesus went to stay with them, they believed themselves because they heard firsthand from Jesus, from what they experienced with him. And what do you find in both these cases? The good news was too good not to share with someone else. Because when you experience something great, what do you do? You invite others to experience it too. It's what we do. It's just what we do. You know, I met Tony uh, a couple weeks ago in the parking lot at worship. He said, if you want to try the best pizza, you need to go over to Mall Me. And I just forgot the name of the pizza place. What was it? Yes. Village Idiot. Village Idiot. I know my pizza. Thank you, Dax. So if you like thin crust pizza, he said, try the Village Idiot. It's the best pizza. Last weekend, we ordered Village Idiot pizza. It did not disappoint. One of the best pizzas I've had since we've been here. When you find something exciting, something good, you share it with other people. It's what we do. That's what we do. So why do we struggle so much with sharing our faith? You know, I think one of the problems when it comes to talking about our faith with others is this, is that we overthink it. We overcomplicate it. We convince ourselves it's too hard. It's not in our gifts to talk about Jesus. And so we think it's someone else's call to do that. And I get that. It is intimidating. It's even scary sometimes to talk about our faith with other people. 
but it doesn't need to be. Think of it this way. All we're doing is this, is we're sharing with the people that God brings into our life. We don't have to go looking. He'll bring them into our life. What you yourself have received from Jesus. That's all we're doing. We're just sharing with someone else what we've received from Jesus. I've had this great cherry pie. You need to go try it too. That's all we're doing. I met this guy, Jesus. He's changed my life. Why don't you come and hear about him too? Because what happens as we encounter Jesus, as he intersects our lives, we experience firsthand the difference that he can make in our life. Some of you have found hope. Others, you've been released from anger. So others, you've been set free from addictions in your life. Others have still have found a new outlook on life. And some of you now have more joy in your life than you ever had before. And when those kind of things happen to us, when we experience Jesus in this way, he becomes very real to us. And as we experience him and our life is changed by our encounter with Jesus, we become compelled to invite others to experience him too. All you have to do is tell others about your experience and invite them to come and see for themselves. And that's all we see Paul doing here in this account in Athens. Paul, a guy whose life was dramatically changed by this encounter that he had with Jesus. He knew firsthand the difference that Jesus can make in a life. And so he was moved to tell as many people as he could about what he had discovered. For Paul, the news was too good not to share. If you read further at the end of that passage that Andrea read in verse 34, what do we find out? That some of those people began to follow Paul and he became believers too. But it would not have happened if Paul wouldn't have invited them to come and see for themselves. And one more thing. I think a second reason that I think is that we need to mention is worth talking about, a reason that we are hesitant to talk about our faith with other people, it's this, that we've somehow come to believe that faith is a private matter. We've come to believe that faith is a private matter. I've heard, I bet you've heard people say that. Maybe you've said it yourself. You say, my faith is a private matter. It's just between me and God. I don't want to force my beliefs on somebody else. But friends, let me tell you, that's a misunderstanding of our faith. Faith is not a private matter. It has never been a private matter. It was never meant to be a private matter. It's personal, yes. It's very personal. But it's not private. Our faith is meant to be shared with others. In fact, that's how we come to faith, because someone else either has told us the good news or they brought us to hear the good news. It goes way back, even in the Old Testament, when God first called Abraham, Genesis chapter 12. God said, Abraham, I'm calling you. I'm going to bless you. Why? So that you will be a blessing to others. I'm going to bless you so that you will be a blessing to others. I like to say we're called to be a so that kind of people. God blesses us so that we can be a blessing to others. It's always been that way. Always been that way from the beginning. Faith is always meant to be shared with other people. Faith is always personal, right? It's always personal. But faith is never just a private matter. Our commission as a church and as followers of Jesus, is to share Jesus with others, to invite them to come and see for themselves, to come with us to see, so that they too might discover and enjoy what we've been fortunate enough to discover ourselves. So I'm going to leave you with this this morning as we close. I found it, I was reading back through my journal this week, and I came across this that I had written in. It's not, they're not my words, um, but it captures my heart. And it's this, only one power exists on this sorry planet that can transform the human heart. Just one. It's the power of the love of Jesus Christ. The love that conquers sin and it wipes out shame. The love that heals wounds and reconciles enemies. It's the love that patches broken dreams and ultimately changes the world one life at a time. And what grips my heart every day is the knowledge that the radical message of the transforming love 
has been given to the church. The radical message of the transform, transforming love of Jesus Christ has been given to you and to me, to the church, to share with others. Because when you experience something great, what do you do? You invite others to experience it too. Friends, this news really is too good not to share. It's too good not to share. Amen? Amen.